let me start the recording. So this is this uh, this first slide is is where we left off, um, and I just kind of want to recap a little bit of what I left off with on Wednesday, um, and then and then move to this example that I think will help us uh, make sense of of these statistics that are talked about in chapter five. So um, I mentioned that starting in chapter five, but in chapter six and chapter seven, we're beginning to, to be introduced to statistical measures of association. Uh, and an, the idea of an association is a question of whether or not two variables are related, uh, two or more variables are related. And, and remember on Monday, I mentioned that in, in the social sciences, we're interested in, in identifying correlations. And part of the reason we, we care if a correlation exists, a relationship between two variables, is because that's one step in, in identifying a causal relationship. So if you want to know if, if a change in variable X corresponds to a change in variable Y, there, there would need to be a correlation. Um, and then there will be some advanced questions you would have to answer as well. But establishing that indeed a correlation does exist is like step one in and 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 making claims about about patterns in directional relationships. So um, as you people who take more vitamin C are happier throughout the day, or people who take more vitamin C are less likely to beat the common cold in a shorter amount of time. Any kind of any kind of causal relationship that we might want to identify starts with identifying a correlation. And so that's what an association is is talking about. And right now we're still dealing with, with bivariate tables or what are called contingency tables or cross tabulations. And the cross tabulations that we've been looking at uh, are presenting two different variables. In this case, um, this is a, a, a chart directly from chapter five. It's a cross tab between um, uh, two questions on the same, on a, on a survey, uh, in, in two variables, I should say, a, vari a question and a variable about the, the sex of the respondent, the survey respondent, in two categories, male or female, and then a question about whether or not they, the survey respondents have been a victim of a crime, yes or no, again, in two categories. Um, just a, a bivariate table, a contingency table like this with some percentages in it or frequencies allow us to make sense of, a, of an association between two variables. But I mentioned that there are that are that there are statistics, um, and three of them are introduced in chapter five: epsilon, delta, and something called chi square. That um, not just tell us, not just help us observe uh, whether or not a difference exists, but also then to what's called test whether a difference exists. And so I showed you epsilon and said that epsilon is just like looking at the percentages, the total percentages. Uh, in each of the cells uh, and, and, and deciding if there's a difference between them. And that's all epsilon is. Is there a difference? Yes or no. Is there a difference greater than zero? Yes or no. Um, and then there, so, so epsilon just, just is looking at a, a set of percentages or descriptive statistics and saying, are, is the average for men different than the average for women? If it is, uh, more than zero, then, then that's what epsilon can reveal. But it, it doesn't really tell you much more beyond that. So then there's this additional statistic that you can use to, to ask about an association called delta. And, and, um, and then delta becomes like a, pre, a precursor to this statistic and statistical test called chi-square. And chi-square is really what the whole chapter is about the chi-square test of independence. And I wanna share, a, a, so, so the notation for chi-square and delta um, is, is included on the slides and you have it in the book. But I mentioned before several times this semester that, that this is not a class where we're gonna do a lot of hand calculations. Um, but the, it's important to, to, to know the, calc, uh, to not, not for you to memorize the calculations, but the reason that the author presents them is, is, is so that you can see kind of the background logic um, that, that's embedded in the notation. But 
I don't want to I don't want to get too lost on the notation. Um, I found an example that that I'm going to walk us through that I think uh, can help you make sense of of what's happening in this equation. Uh, but I'll just quickly point out a couple things. Uh, so we've we've already seen this sign here before. That's the summation sign or the or the capital Greek letter for sigma, and that just means add up everything over here, right? Um, this is the Greek letter chi. It looks like an X, uh, chi squared. Um, so, and then in the parentheses on this side of the equation, you have uh, F, which stands uh, for frequency, and then a subscript O, so the observed frequency, and then the F with the subscript E is the expected frequency. So we're, we're taking something called an observed frequency, something called an expected frequency. We're, looks like we're going to square that, or, you know, take the differences, square it, add up those squared differences, then divide by the expected frequency again, if, if we were going to try to quickly pick apart that notation. But here, here's an example that I think will help us um, make sense of, of, of what the math is doing. Because one, one of the problems with statistics classes and learning statistics is that, is that something, especially like chi-square, like in the interpretation of it, it is not intuitive and but if you if if we kind of pull the curtain back or, or go a few steps backwards and sort of see the building blocks of, of what's happening in the equation i hope i think it will it will help us make better sense of it so um so this is a hypothetical example uh but let's say that we have uh we we did a survey on on television shows on um, people and which shows they watch. And we, we, we asked a question about, about glee because we wanted to know if there was a relationship between uh, sex or sex category, male and female, and how, whether or not people watch this show, th that show glee. And so let's say we have 50% uh, men and 50% women in our survey data about glee. And again, we want to know the relationship between glee and sex those two variables. If gender or sex, if that variable is independent of our question about watching Glee, how many men can we expect to answer yes to the question about Glee? So we have 100, and this is a question I want someone to unmute themselves or drop, drop an answer in the chat. We have 100 men and we have 100 women. These are the column Really quick, let me just point something out. These are the uh, the marginals, right? This, this is the row percentages, the row totals, I'm sorry. And then down here, 120 and 80 are the column totals. So right now on this graph, all we have is, is these marginal information. And I'm asking you about this cell here. If if we, we can predict how many men watch Glee, if we know if we know these marginal totals, and I'm telling you in this hypothetical example, let's imagine that there is no relationship between watching Glee and gender. If there's if there was no relationship whatsoever, if men and women weren't different in terms of whether or not they watch Glee, what would this number here be? The number for men who say yes, I watch Glee. Okay. Oh, thanks, John. I see uh, some guesses coming in. John, John says 20. So the number is not 20. Someone else want to guess? There's 100 men and there's 100 women. So we have a 50-50 split in this survey. If there's- Can it just be 50 then? If there was a there's a hundred people and there's a fifty there's like you know fifty fifty split so it would be just fifty. Yeah. So so uh, it, was that John? Was that you again? Yes. Oh, thanks, John. So um, so it would be it would be fifty percent. Okay. So we have a ratio. We have a we have a, a fifty fifty ratio, um, and we see that here. Um, but in terms of the column, the column of yes. Um, this would be 50% of 120 or, or 60. This, and then that would be, so this would be a 50-50 split. And then this would be a 50, 
the, the answers under yes would be 50-50, and then the answers under no would also be 50-50. So you'd have 60, 60, and 40, and 40. That, that number, 60, 60, and 40, 40, um, are theoretical, they're hypothetical, and that's what are called the expected values in this specific example. The reason, the reason that um, there, I said that they're theoretical is because um, all, all we had was the total. And then I, I gave you the uh, criteria that, that there's no relationship between these two variables. If there's no relationship between the two variables, um, then we would see the, the proportions in, the, in each cell look the same as the, as, as the row total proportions. This, this um, graphic here is sometimes called the, mo the model of no association. And these values represent what we would expect if there's no relationship whatsoever between watching Glee and gender. Um, any deviation from these numbers here, 60, 60, 40, 40, any, any deviation, um, so, so this is a theoretical distribution of men and women who watch Glee based on the assumption that there's no difference between or there's no relationship between gender and watching Glee. If, if we were to go out and do a survey and ask people uh, and then populate this bivariate table with our actual collected data, any numbers that deviate from 60 for men who watch Glee um, is an indication that there's some sort of relationship between the variables or that they're not independent. So that so so this is the ex, the expected values. It's a theoretical distribution based on the assumption that the variables are independent of each other. Uh, the pre the previous table represented the again the expected survey results if gender wasn't a factor and people choosing to watch Glee. This this table with the blue coefficients represents the real survey data. Um, in this hypothetical example. So looking at the real survey, let's say we, we go out and we ask 200 people, uh, 100 men and 100 women, whether or not they, they watch Glee, and these are the results that we get. What does this table suggest about the relationship between gender and choosing to watch Glee? If we, if we saw these numbers, would we, would we think that gender and Glee are independent or would we think that there's some sort of relationship here? Oh, and that's a real, that's a question that I, that I would like someone to try to answer. If you saw this, if you saw this, this data, these numbers in blue, do they suggest that there's a relationship between watching Glee and gender or, or no? I would say yes. Yeah. So, uh, and, and why, why, why would you say yes? What about? You can, you can see the, like, the what's the word I'm looking for uh, discrepancy just like how everything is shifted like you can see that the majority of males don't watch Glee but the majority of females do watch Glee exactly I mean and I mean yeah you said it perfect so in the second table just by the fact that those numbers aren't equal is evidence that there's some sort of relationship here between between gender and choosing to watch Glee But there's a, a, an important additional question that you would have to ask, and that's how much do the values in, in red, the, or the values in blue, the ones that we observed and actually collected in our survey, how different are they than the, this theoretical um, distribution? And in red, again, this is called, th this is a model of no association. This is a theoretical distribution in a world where the, these variables are equal or where the association is zero or these, the, there's no relationship between watching Glee and gender. In, in blue uh, is, is what we saw. And as John said, 
what we see by looking at the numbers is that they're different. But but how do we know that that those differences matter? And this this gets us into into the statistical tests that that are presented in the chapter. So one thing that that uh, we'd probably want to do is maybe subtract the observed values from the expected values so we can see how far off how far off they are and we don't really care if the difference is positive or negative here since either way if the results are way off then we know that the difference is big and and it's giving us some proof that that maybe there these these the, these uh, variables are um related somehow or are or, or associated this column here, this O minus E, that's basically the delta statistic, taking the, the observed um, the observed value and taking the difference between the observed value and the expected value for each cell. Um, that, that gives you uh, what is called the delta statistic. So I have a question. Oh, Sorry. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Uh -huh. So traditional like addition subtraction, you would take the bigger number, put it first, then right. subtract it. So for this, you wouldn't do that. You would just it would just go observed minus the expected. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks for thanks for pointing that out. So in this case, we 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 really don't care if it's a negative number or a positive number. Okay. Um, because because it's more like the Delta statistic is really just a question of, is there a difference? So the negative 35, anything other than zero is a difference, whether it's negative or positive. Gotcha, and, thank you. Um, so, the next, so the next step is, is uh, in, in trying to make sense of, of these differences and whether or not they're significant is to square the observed minus the expected values. Um, and this and this is a way that that gets rid of those negative numbers. Uh, so now we're if if we square the uh, the delta statistic, uh, you you end up getting a set of numbers that are that are all positive. But the problem is the numbers are are too big. And by too big, I mean uh, we it's always helpful. Think back to when we were dealing with mean, median, and mode. It's always helpful to have a statistics that that's in the same unit of measurement as as the rest as the variables, let's say. So this, you know, 1225 is much larger than either any of the observed or the expected values. So one of the ways that um, we can get it back down to the size uh, in a range that's that's similar to our actual values is to is to normalize this this exponent here. And we haven't really talked about the word normalization a lot in this class. But uh, one way that you can do that is to divide uh, this number by the expected values. If you divide, if you uh, on this last column on this slide uh, is taking all of those expected, the difference between the expected values, then we squared them, and then we divided it by the expected values again. And here we have a column that, uh, of values that are closer in scale to the original values. Uh, but notice this is a this is a set of now four decimals um, that it's a bunch of numbers that we're, we're still trying to answer this question are gender and glee related and now we have four decimals and, and that's kind of hard to make sense of it would be a lot more useful if there was one single number that we could use and we can get that one single number by adding up all of these normalized differences if we add up all of the normalized difference, we get one single number. And that one single number is what's called the chi-square st statistic. So the, the, chi the chi-square statistic is, is a sum of all of these normalized differences, essentially. And so without, um, it's not um, necessary to, again, to learn the formula and memorize the formula. Uh, because we're not actually going to be doing any any calculations, uh, we're going to be taking the chi-square test um, in the, like from output. SPSS will do the calculation for us, but the chi-square statistic. Once we have that single number, that's that's the the sum of the you know normalized differences. Um, chi-square, uh, one single number. Uh, it's one statistic, one value. That value moves us from 
checking or observing or just seeing if a relationship exists to actually testing if it's statistically significant. So the epsilon statistic is, is sort of like just seeing if, if the numbers are different. Uh, but chi-square doesn't just check to see if there's a difference. It checks to see if the, there's a difference and it, it checks to see if the difference is statistically significant. Is statistically significant. In statistics parlance, we're, we're using the chi-square statistic to test what's called a null hypothesis. And the null hypothesis is probably one of the trickiest concepts to make sense of and to interpret in, in, in statistics classes. And I'm, I'm introducing it today, but it's something that we're going to be using. Um, there's null hypothesis for other types of statistics, not just uh, for other statistical tests of significance, not just chi-square, uh, but this is the first time we're hearing it. So um, if you can't make sense of what a null hypothesis is after chapter five, don't worry. Hopefully we'll have multiple iterations of, of this where we can work on making sense of, of what it means. But uh, on the slide here, I have a definition of, of the null hypothesis. The null hypothesis is a statement that's assumed to be true unless there's strong evidence against it. And for chi-square, uh, the, the null hypothesis is this. Uh, we're testing, this is how you would say it. We are testing the hypothesis that there is no significant relationship between the categorical variables that we're looking at, between, uh, for instance, glee and gender or between victim status and gender, the, the previous example. We're testing the uh, it's, it's a the null hypothesis is is basically us testing whether or not our two variables are independent or not or, or not, and it's it's kind of weird. Um, but I I I, I mentioned this a little bit on Monday, or, or my my intention was to to tie these together on Monday. But if if uh, going to a lab and conducting an experiment is like the gold standard of science. This is more, the null hypothesis is, is a, a type of statistical logic that's like, allows you to do some sort of statistical experimenting. But um, the null hypothesis is one, is one um, piece we need to understand and interpret the chi-square, but there's a couple other things that we need to make sense of chi-square too. I'll come back to null hypothesis um, in just a second. Um, so here's here's some output uh, from chapter five, and this is still dealing with uh, sex and victim status, I believe. That same that same that original problem. So we again we won't be calculating chi square. I, I won't ask you on the problem set. The book asks you on the on one of the exercises to calculate chi square. I'm not going to ask you to chi square be, uh, to, to calculate chi square because SBS will do that for us. But we need to understand the output and and what the output is showing us in eventually how to how to put into words like whether we can accept or reject the null hypothesis, which is type of the, the type of interpretation that goes along with this statistic. So here's here's the here's the output that you might get from SPSS. And there's a lot going on here, but there's really only three columns or three cells that uh, one row and three three columns that, that really matter for right now. So uh, the, the Pearson chi-square under value, this is the, the, this is the number. Like if we did the math for the chi-square formula and we came up with that one single number that represented the average difference between the expected and the observed values, this is what that statistic would be. But then there's two other cells here that we need to uh, interpret the chi-square. Something called degrees of freedom are abbreviated as DF. And then the significance value is here, this 0.853. Now this is, um, there, there's, well, okay, before I move to the next slide, let me just say this. Degrees of freedom are, are something that are, I think first introduced in chapter five but really not um, anything we, we've covered yet. So let me just let me just read what what and this is page eighty three of our book. 
uh, but what the what the author says about what a degree of freedom is, because I think it's helpful to think about, um, especially in, in connection to something I said in class on Monday. So the degrees of freedom is a statistical method of compensating for error. It's a statistical method for compensating for error that arises when samples are used rather than populations. It's also a compensation for small data sets. So I mentioned this uh, on Monday as a refresher, but also at the beginning of the semester. In, in sociology and social science research and criminology, we're, we almost never have access to the entire population of people. Uh, so we, we sample smaller populations. One of, one of the shortcomings with survey research or quantitative research and statistical research is that you don't have the full population. Statisticians luckily have come up with, with certain logical fixes that say, well, if you don't have, if you have a small sample size or if you only were able to survey a fraction of the population, then you need to account for that measurement error, the potentially biased um, measurements you have uh, using this thing called degrees of freedom. So anyway, that's what a degrees of freedom is, is that's what a de degrees of freedom is. It's a way of compensating for the fact that you don't got all the data that you, that you ought to have to, to make this test very, very, very sure. Okay. And then, and then let me jump to the next slide to explain what, what this next value is. Cause the degrees of freedom and in this significance test or the, the significant value go hand in hand. So we haven't really talked a lot about significance levels because we're just getting into the point of the class where we're doing statistical testing. But um, there's, there's a few in the back of your book, there's a few uh, appendices and starting on uh, appendix one, which is I can tell you in a second or appendix A, so on page 203 of your book, there's, there's something called Appendix A. And Appendix A, uh, Appendix B, Appendix C, and Appendix D all have some information about degrees of freedom and levels of significance. And what these are is charts that, that you use to interpret uh, the statistics, uh, the statistical tests that you run. So in our case, we're using chi-square. So the the table that we need to interpret chi-square is, is, is appendix A in our book. And this, this graphic that I found uh, to include in the PowerPoint is uh, just cuts off at five degrees of freedom. Um, and you'll notice that the probability levels are in opposite order. So our book starts um, um, the column all the way to the, the final column here on the picture is the first is the first column in our book. So basically what, what this thing is, is um, I, I can't remember like how, if I said this or if I did like how clearly I stated it, but um, when it comes to statistical testing, the, the, the verbiage that's used is like, uh, for, Maybe, maybe I'll tie it back to the null hypothesis. So we're, we're, we're using this null hypothesis that's saying, uh, in general, the null hypothesis is saying, in general, the, the data that you observed is likely to, any differences you see in the data you, you collected is likely to happen by chance. Uh, the, the burden of proof is on the researcher to, to, to prove statistically that that it's not by chance. And there are different cutoffs that are accepted in the statistical world at how much proof do you have? And, and how much proof you have or how, like how uh, powerful your explanation is, I wanna be careful with the word power because that's a statistical term that will come up later. But, but one of the ways we talk about that in statistics is in terms of probabilities. What is the prob probability or likelihood that something would happen in the case of the null hypothesis and chi-square, we're asking what's the probability that my observed differences, what I, what I see is, is a matter of chance or not. And 
what these different levels represent is cutoff points that statisticians uh, will use in terms of like um, how confident we are that, that, that what we see in our data is actually something real and not something that would happen by chance. And, and the way that you make sense of this is this 0.5 probability level means there's 50% chance that I'm right, the researcher that I'm right. And there's a 50% chance that any patterns I see in my data are a matter of error, of some kind of error or bias. This, um, this 0.5, uh, this 0.10 means there's a 90% probability that this was not a matter of chance or not due to error. This next probability level um, is there's a 95% probability that this wasn't by chance, a 98% likelihood that this wasn't by chance, a 99% chance, and a 99.9% uh, probability that what we observed in the data, whatever statistic that we found, did not occur by chance and is actually something that is what is called statistically significant. In the social sciences, most, most probability, most statistical tests are checked against the 0.05 probability or a 0.01 probability, which means um, uh, in the social sciences, mo what that looks like is most research, most research findings are um, within 95% or 99% uh, probability range. So let's say there's a finding on Oh, the findings on, on first trimester moving and low birth, birth weight. If, if the researchers found that correlation, that association to in fact be true, the way that they would say that is birth moving causes low birth weight. We're, we're pretty sure that's true. And pretty, by pretty sure, we're 95% sure that that's true. What we found in our data is true. Or if, if they use the, the, this, this higher... Um, probability level, you can say 99.9% um, .9 chance, sure, this happened. Anyway, how does this tie into the chi-square statistic? What When you get SPS output, you'll get a, a chi-square statistic, you'll get a degrees of freedom, and then you'll get a probability level. And um, or you'll, you'll get the, 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 the level of significance. And you basically would take the degrees of freedom Let's say let's say you didn't um, you didn't have SPSS output and you were calculating chi square by hand. There there is a formula for determining the degrees of freedom, and let's say it's degrees of freedom of one, and uh, you know you would you would you would um, use the chart to kind of find to to like scroll through here and figure out like oh if I have two degrees of freedom in chi square and I and I want to a threshold of, of 95%, which is which is typical in the in the social sciences. Um, you know, this is this is the value I'm looking for. But um, we don't necessarily need to do a lot of that look at chi square and then go to the back of the book because we're not doing the hand calculations. You just need to you'll just need to remember uh, the 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 sort of 0.05 and 0.01 probability levels, which are most common in social science research. So here, back to that, that, that table I was showing before, here's the per Pearson chi-square value. It's telling us there's one degrees of freedom. And then it's telling us that there's, that the significance level is, is 0.85. And that 0.85 significance level mean, means that there's an 85% chance that, that the value that we got here occurred by chance. That's not a good. That's not a good number. And um, why it's not a good number won't be intuitive right now because this is the first time we're talking about statistic uh, significance testing. But really, all all we're going to be looking for is whether or not the value that shows up in the significance column is smaller than 0.05 or smaller than 0.01. If it is, then we're within then we're within the probability range uh, where we can comfortably reject the null hypothesis, which means, uh, and again, if the null hypothesis is there's no relationship between sex and victim status, uh, 
where there's no relationship between uh, sex and watching Glee. This one is sex and victim status. So let's keep that example. The null hypothesis in this example is that there's no relationship between these two variables, between victim status and sex. We run the chi-square test, we get a value of this, uh, but, but what's more important than the chi-square statistic is the significance level. If the significance level is not within the range uh, or is not within uh, the a level of probability that, that we're comfortable with, then what we say is we reject the null, or we fail to reject the null hypothesis. Um, <laughs> If you fail to reject the null hypothesis, that means that an alternative hypothesis could be true. Um, but it gets messy at that point because because proving an alternative hypothesis is hard. So what this test is doing is 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 asking whether we can reject a null hypothesis. A null hypothesis is a, is a is a statement that says there's no relationship between two variables. Because we're interested in correlations and we're interested in changing in one variable relating to a change in another variable, we hope to reject the null hypothesis. If you reject the null hypothesis, what you're able to say is, is like, let's say this number was within the 0.05 range. Then, then, we, then we could say that, that um, we, would, we can reject the null hypothesis and we are 95 percent sure that there is some association between sex and victim status. But what this, what this um, particular output is telling us is that actually um, we can't make that claim um, given this data. We cannot claim that there's any rela relationship between sex and victim status. We failed, in this example, we have what's called failed to reject the null hypothesis. Okay, so um, in the this PowerPoint ends with uh, just some more information that this comes directly from the book. Um, some criteria for using uh, chi-square, what are the limitations of chi-square? And then at the end of the chapter, um, the author introduces several statistics very quickly, in my opinion, that, that really are more relevant as we move into, into chapter six. So um, chapter so chapter five in, in the chi square statistic in the chi square statistic chi square is, is perfect for nominal variable and there's sometimes there's there's like ordinal or, or interval data that's turned into categories that sometimes you can use the chi square but there's other there's other statistics like Spearman's row or Pearson's R we're gonna we're gonna lambda there, there's other statistics that we're gonna learn. Um, but what's cool about all of them is the interpretation ends up being pretty similar. Using degrees of freedom or, or using this uh, value, which is called the significance value, and, and thinking of the cutoff as either 0 0.05 or 0 0.01, with all the statistics we're going to continue to learn about, the interpretation will be, are we able to uh, reject or accept the null? Are we able to reject or fail to reject the null hypothesis based on a su significance level uh, of 0.05 or 0.01 or less? Um, okay, so so that is. Uh, well, let me stop the recording at this point. And